Hi friends, uh, welcome to uh, Coffee with uh, Ravi. Today we have uh, a guest on, uh, Dr. Uh, Rich Manfredi is one of uh, our partners here. Uh, Dr. Manfredi uh, trained uh, in gastroenterology at Rust University uh, in Chicago. He has uh, some specific research interests that we're trying to translate into clinical practice here. Um, I will let uh, uh, Rich uh, uh, introduce his own background uh, briefly and uh, talk about the work that he's done at uh, Rush University uh, to begin with. And then today what we'll focus on is how we can use some of the work and experience that he has done, how the field has evolved in the area of movement disorders, specifically what we're talking about are, uh, disorders such as Parkinson's, etc., et and how the gut-brain axis is connected, what potentially we could do to prevent these diseases, and what, and for people who have these diseases, how we can treat gut symptoms or symptoms that are associated with the digestive uh, uh, tract. So uh, quite a lot to cover and we hope to do it in about 10-15 minutes and uh, I, uh, I hope that you will find this uh, as fascinating as I do. So Rich, if you want to introduce yourself in terms of your uh, uh, interest in this area as well as your uh, uh, experience uh, uh, till you got here. Sure. Well, thanks very much, Dr. Ravi. So first of all, it's, it's an absolute pleasure to be in the community here. Um, you know, I, I had recently completed my training in, in GI over at Rush Medical Center. Um, and even before that, I was interested in, in ways that we could um, deliver care that um, meet the needs of, of our patients. Um, but also uh, uh, build on existing science um, in, in the area. So my particular area of interest is in the um, gut-brain axis, as uh, Dr. Ravi alluded to, um, and that concerns the, the connection between the GI system, so mostly everything from the esophagus down to the anus, um, and how it interacts with the central nervous system. Um, and in recent years, studies have shown that the two systems interact in several different ways. One is through nerves, as you can imagine, the, the body has nerves that um, communicate between different organ systems. Um, and, but newer research now is showing um, a connection between the microbiota or the bacteria um, of the digestive tract and hormones or molecules that are secreted into the systemic circulation or the body um, that can impact the brain. So things such as um, movement and um, higher level uh, organization in, in the mind really have not been the, the, the purview of uh, GI for many years. Um, but since we have more information now regarding the microbiota or the bacteria and how they interact with the wall of the GI system, we've begun to see how uh, your bacteria, and everybody has unique bacteria in the digestive tract, how that can impact these higher level functions such as movement. Um, and in my, my research, we found that people who struggle with neurodegenerative diseases, in particular Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, often have bacteria in the GI tract that's different from people they share the uh, household living conditions with, so different from their spouses, let's say. And what we found is that the difference in bacteria between people who have uh, neurodegenerative disease and versus healthy people can really dictate some of the uh, functions at a hormonal level um, that, that can help us to understand disease. So what does that mean for, for patients now? Well, it means that once we understand how the GI system interacts with the central nervous system, we can then introduce uh, therapies, advice and, and medications in some cases to uh, improve the, the makeup of the bacteria of the digestive system um, and that can then in turn improve um, neuro, uh, neurodegenerative disease or muscular function. Um, that can come from a variety of, of different sources. One of them is diet. Um, the other source is utilizing medications in novel ways to treat neurodegenerative dis diseases. Um, and these are all things that we're excited to bring to, to patients as the, as the science emerges. And I think as, as people begin to be trained, as, as uh, physicians begin to be trained in this area, um, it's something that I, I really want to make sure it has a, a positive impact on our patients. So, in other words, Rich, everybody has a unique bacterial footprint or fingerprint, right, uh, in their gut. 
So approximately what? How many bacteria does a human being, about a, a tri, a hundred, uh, what's, what's well, the well, numbers? Indi individually, uh, trillions of bacteria. Trillions, right? And do these bacteria as we, A, do as in an individual, does it remain fairly constant or does it change with disease states or diet and things like that? What do we know about that? Well, once someone reaches adolescence, the, the uh, bacteria in the GI tract usually remain fairly static. Um, however, certain disease states um, can cause aberrations in the bacterial makeup. For example, um, in neurodegenerative disease, we see uh, too much bacteria that cause inflammation and too little bacteria that um, produce uh, hormone that lead to the secretion of hormones that uh, protect the brain. Let's say so. So th having diseases um, or even changing your diet can alter the bacteria in important ways. So, so then. To take that further, then uh, you you know you you've talked very eloquently about in in different presentations about the work. How can you walk us through what's the uh, the Brock hypothesis or how the steps from the how the change in from a change in gut bacteria? What are the steps by which it's postulated or or even partially proven that Alzheimer's or Parkinson's is caused? How does, what are the steps from the gut, you know, from this change in the bacteria? Sure, yeah, so that's, that's, a, that's quite a controversial area in the field actually, so, I, so this is not by any means settled. Um, but Parkinson's disease in particular is caused by misfolded proteins in the brain. Um, and that's actually how I began studying this, was not from a GI perspective, but from a brain perspective. Why do these proteins aggregate in the brain? Why do they form clumps that can damage the neurons? Um, and tr trying to figure that out, we were wondering, well, where do these protein clumps start? So in 2003, um, uh, Heiko Brack hypothesized that um, the misfolded proteins that cause neurodegenerative disease begin in the GI tract. Um, and they traverse a nerve that connects the gut and the brain called the vagus nerve um, and move, actually can move from the GI system to the brain. Now that's been called into question. However, there are some very good data that support it, such as mice studies. Um, it's also less likely for people who have had the vagus nerve cut to experience Parkinson's disease. Because, and it's and, cut because in, in, there have been some surgeries in the past uh, that, uh, you know, for example, with ulcer disease, et cetera, when we didn't know it, vagotomies were very common. Right, right. Yeah. I certainly wouldn't advocate vagotomies, but we, we've seen patients who have had those in the, in the past. Um, and the other piece of information that is um, supported of, of this hypothesis is that patients who develop Parkinson's um, or other neurodegenerative disorders, but in particular, the um, disorders caused by aggregation of a protein called alpha-synuclein will get constipation or GI symptoms sometimes 10, 10 or more years before uh, they develop neurological symptoms. Um, so it's, it's plausible then that these diseases actually begin in the digestive tract. Maybe it has something to do with, with the abnormal bacteria that lead to translocation of abnormal proteins from the gut to the brain, but, but our studies are still working that out. So, so in a sense, I guess, friends, what we're talking about is the bacteria change as step one. Step two, somehow stuff gets across the gut laning. In other words, sort of the leaky gut. And step three in this hypothesis is that these abnormal folded proteins that are formed in the gut tra track all the way up the vagus into the brain and then cause these movement, you know, like Parkinson's. And by the way, Parkinson's, as you know, is a movement disorder where there is a whole host of neurological symptoms. Mm -hmm. such, and what, what do we see with Parkinson's usually? It's a tremor, well, it's a... Um, yeah, so Parkinson's usually comes on as a tremor um, in the hand let's say, um, or in one of the, the limbs there's a tremor and then it oftentimes will spread to other parts of the, of the body. Um, and uh, another symptom of Parkinson's is something called bradykinesia or slowing of the body, um, oftentimes tra uh, changes in facial expression. Um, and then that is, some, is usually accompanied by um, cognitive dysfunction, sometimes autonomic dysfunction, um, and usually uh, constipation or GI issues. Uh, constipation as well as difficulty swallowing, are, those are the uh, two most common issues that we see in our Parkinson's patients. 
So what I've been interested in is how, you know, how can we reverse that? Yeah. Um, and so uh, w one of the ways that we've seen is to um, first not, not wait too long if you develop these symptom any movement symptoms, um, see a neurologist who can make the diagnosis. Um, but then if the GI symptoms are particularly prominent, um, we recommend first that we address it through the diet. Um, so I recommend a diet that um, is, serves as food not only for you, but also for the bacteria in your gut. And those bacteria um, that are anti-inflammatory are the ones that we want. We've studied a number of different diets, and, and the one that's sort of come out on top is something called the Mediterranean diet. It's a diet that's rich in fruits, vegetables, uh, nuts, lean meats like chicken and fish, and, and lower in processed foods and red meats. And sticking to a, a diet like that is going to be um, important to maintaining a, hel a healthy gut bacteria. So what we can do is help to optimize the diet in our Parkinson's patients. The other thing is we're trying different um, strategies for improving uh, constipation. And so one thing that we're interested in doing is, is introducing trials to, uh, like clinical trials to improve constipation through pharmacologic methods. Sometimes though, that's not, that's not actually getting to the root of the problem. And sometimes the root of the problem is the, the movement of the muscles that allow someone to have a proper bowel movement. And to determine that, we do motility studies such as anorectal manometry to diagnose those problems and then treat that through a technique called biofeedback, which is a physical therapy-based technique. So as you can see, the, these, the GI problems in, in, in general and in neurodegenerative disease in, in particular um, can be very complex and it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, you really have to be tested for uh, your specific uh, mechanism of constipation um, or your specific mechanism of swallowing difficulties um, and then have a targeted approach that's right for you. Not all of my patients want to take um, additional medication and I, I certainly um, would agree with that. There's no reason that you would have to unless we strongly recommend it. Um, many of our patients do well with dietary changes or physical therapy. Um, and I've spoken with a number of neurologists about this issue, and one thing they all agree on is, is movement is very important. So patients who have Parkinson's disease uh, benefit quite a bit from exercise. Um, there's a uh, novel boxing program that many of them are, are members of. And having, having movement um, helps to stave off the movement disorder changes in Parkinson's, but it also, we found, helps the GI symptoms as well, Im improving bowel frequency and consistency, and improving overall sense of well-being by getting rid of this, uh, some of those issues that are related to digestion. So then, if which group of patients should, or if you know, constipation is a fairly common issue, mm -hmm. and if somebody is developing constipation, which is, are there any additional markers of this group of patients that can develop neurodegenerative diseases as, with constipation as the lead-in symptom, and what should patients uh, or family members be on lookout for? You know, this is one of those areas that, that is, is still a, a gray area in terms of, of diagnosis, um, and that is I, I certainly don't want everyone with constipation to be worried about developing a neurodegenerative disease. Um, although in among the patients who do develop a neurodegenerative disease, um, about roughly 40 to 50 percent will begin with what I call gut first symptoms, which is um, constipation um, that then that then progresses to a movement disorder. So if if your only symptoms are GI related, um, it's not. Um, completely necessary to get a workup for movement disorders. That's not yet been, been the case. Um, in fact, we, we do recommend anyone with GI symptoms, including constipation, to seek healthy diets because improving the microbiota in even a um, healthy patient who has constipation, let's say, will improve the, the symptoms of constipation and it will also improve um, their chances of, of developing, uh, will help reduce their chances of developing uh, neurodegenerative diseases secondary to um, abnormal bacteria in the future. Mm -hmm. and, and what can general patients who have none of this, so there's no family history of any of these problems, what diet, what should they be doing from a dietary standpoint, you know, based on 
your interpretation and reading of the literature and being close to this area? Sure, yeah. So I, I've worked with um, several nutritionists who have put together different diets related to Parkinson's and neurodegenerative disease. One of them that came out of Rush is called the MIND diet, M-I-N-D. Um, and that is a, a type of diet that's su supposedly good for um, mental health and also uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Um, but in general, I, I always recommend, and, and my, my mentors in this area have very specific diets that they recommend. Um, they recommend things like ancient grains um, and uh, uh, very, very low amounts of meat. Um, personally, with my patients, I don't recommend any restrictive diet. And the reason is because many of them are already losing weight because of their um, difficulty swallowing or because of their disease. Um, so I want, I want the diet that works well for you. Um, however, that being said, the diets that I do prefer are the prebiotic diets that serve as food for the bact healthy bacteria, healthy anti-inflammatory bacteria in the GI tract. Um, and so, like I said, the, the Mediterranean diet is kind of what, what, we, what is, um, has come out on top. Um, it, particularly because of the types of fiber um, in that diet um, serve as a food source for the bacteria that produce uh, something called short-chain fatty acids, um, which are metabolites that can influence the secretion of hormones that can protect the central nervous system. Um, and that's also the, the, the trend now with um, therapeutic development is we, we want to improve the neuroendocrine system, which is the hormonal signaling between the gut and the brain. And there have been um, some drug trials recently for um, medications that do that. Um, however, m many of those medications can interfere with blood sugar um, or other, have other side effects. And so I, really doing a, a, a dietary approach is, I, I believe, it, it is optimal. Um, and if we can get someone to stick with a diet that's protective of both the gut and the brain, I think that's a win-win a for all of us. Um, and and if, if patients need pharmacotherapy, we're happy to, to do that. Um, but I think diet is definitely the, the starting place. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll, we'll continue to come back to these topics in different uh, ta uh, ways in the, into the future. But two things that I want you all to uh, take into consideration. We have, we are now with, in patients who have, in some of you who have these movement disorders or family members, we have a little more refined approach with uh, Dr. Manfredi being here in, in trying to get those symptoms uh, under control. And the second piece is that we are trying to bring to our area several trials that will bring newer medications as well as newer technologies that are not available in the mainstream aspect of it, but are available in a trial. So more to come on that, and we'll kind of continue to post that in coffee talks as well as uh, on the website. And uh, we're so glad to have uh, Dr. Manfredi here with us, uh, uh, bringing his experience uh, uh, with his, uh, you know, he's been trained at uh, uh, MIT and Harvard and uh, uh, Rush University, etc. So bringing all of those expertise to uh, our uh, patients here, I think, is a is a wonderful uh, addition to our practice. So feel free to call us. Uh, we'll feel free to uh, email us, and we'll continue to talk to you this way. Um, thank you.